Okay, so we've basically been lagging behind, behind, or I guess really with, with covering stories from other comic books, right? I mean, for the most part with Marvel, we've stuck to like Immortal Hulk and like House and Powers of X. And that's basically been it <laughs> for the most part, which hardly covers what they have. And so what I want to do here is I want to cover the, uh, I want to cover Tony Stark Iron Man, right? I want to cover this, this really, really cool volume, right? This, the second, uh, second volume, right? Because the first one is just a series of one shots and they're not even really necessary. The second volume is really where things take off. This is one of the things to always remember when it comes to Dan Slott is he's very, very big on taking over a title and then basically reworking everything within the first few volumes in order to make it his own. But this one uh, really initially picks up with, with uh, Andy Bang basically, you know, having knocked boots with Tony Stark's mom, right? With Amanda Armstrong. Now remember, Andy Bang was a, a guy who was who was newly, he's like the new hire when it comes to Stark Industries, right? He was created by, by Dan Slott. And the idea was that Andy Bang was really, really smart when it came to robotics, but Tony Stark seemed to be smarter. And the result was that during a contest they had when, when Tony was younger, Tony absolutely demolished him and then 20 years later brought Andy on board for Tony Stark's new robotics division right so it's one of these things where Tony Stark usually consolidates intelligent minds that are as capable as he is if not better depending on what their nuanced capabilities are but the idea with this is that Amanda Armstrong is basically struggling with the fact that since Tony Stark has returned from the dead essentially following the events of Civil War 2 that he's always he really kind of seems to be distant doesn't really want to have anything to do with her now remember Amanda Armstrong is the biological mom of Tony and that's something that we learned during the story of internet National Iron Man, which you guys will find that link down in the description. And in fact, if you guys are really interested in kind of getting caught up on Iron Man in terms of where things stand right now, you'll find a playlist uh, down there that'll basically have everything running from, I want to say Kieran Gillen's run and the introduction of Arno Stark, his, his brother that he didn't know about, like the life and death of Tony Stark, the God Killer armor, all that kind of stuff, all the way up to starting to cover this story right now. But it's cool. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting because the reason why Tony seems so really removed from everything is that what Tony Stark has created is something called the Escape. Now, let's kind of be honest with ourselves here. This is basically the Oasis, and, and it's, it's cool, you know, for what it is, but it's Dan Slott just kind of running off with a particular idea. <laughs> now, here's the thing. It's not the worst idea ever by Dan Slott. I mean, Ready Player One was an amazing movie, and it was a, it was an even better book. An, an enormous open world VR simulation, right? That you could just, like, be whoever you want it to be, right? Like, abandon reality and be whoever you want it to be. It's kind of a cool concept. The issue is that it creates a disconnect between reality, right? So, I mean, it's never really good to abandon reality in that regard. But Tony Stark creating this, is a cool way for him to kind of do his own thing, right? To kind of operate outside of, of what's happening with regards to, you know, everything else in the real world. And, and this is kind of the nature of Tony Stark, right? The nature of Tony Stark is that he's always sort of going from one gig to the next, right? He's always going from one thing to the next, but this seems a little bit different because a lot of times it's developing new suits of armor, right? That's kind of his retreat. It's what he does when things become overwhelming. He retreats back to his lab and he starts developing new armors. With this one, it's a complete and total escape from reality. And that's why things are kind of crazy is because what you end up doing from there is of course you end up picking up with Iron Man himself along with James Rhodes and the Wasp uh, who Iron Man is currently with at the moment it's interesting to see this because like her James Rhodes and, and of course Iron Man all fighting together is, is really just kind of dealing with like some crazy you know hijacking of of you know like supplies and things like that and the reason why this is so intriguing is because the exact same simulation is actually happening in the escape and what this does is it kind of stretches tony stark thin not so much in terms of him himself but in terms of his ai right because right now his ai is basically powered by motherboard you know it's you kind of you know remove the whole friday concept gave friday an actual physical body which you know she operates inside of uh, stark industries and instead motherboard is a new ai but motherboard runs both the escape and tony stark's armor and so it's not really able to kind of work with both in conjunction and so what you end up running into to is like this one kid who's basically being a dick inside the escape right so like anybody on xbox live and uh and the result is that he actually ends up like freaking out losing his mind like cussing and screaming at everybody because i don't know i guess he's getting carried away with himself and ends up getting banned by the system and it is it is kind of cool because as soon as tony stark finishes his whole mission and he shows back up and uh and he ends up talking with amanda she of course is trying to get things sorted out in terms of hey look we need to communicate we need to sit down and have like a heart-to-heart -heart talk about like pretty much everything, Tony Stark kind of blows her off and goes back into the escape and says, look, like there are things that need to be figured out here. There are things that we have to, that we have to kind of sort out and, and understand what's going on. Now, of particular importance, a character that I want to focus on here for a second is a character named Bethany. Now, Bethany is important here because in the first three, or for really the first five issues or so, we were getting these small little things that might as well equal like backup, backup stories, like backup features, right? Like a thing that happens in a panel. But basically, Bethany would get these kind of blanks in her, in her day, right? Like she would just forget about what was going on or she would start talking and it wouldn't 
couldn't be her that was talking. Given the way that the first five issues basically ended, we essentially know it's the controller. And for those of you guys who are unfamiliar, the controller originally appeared back in Iron Man issue number 12 in 1969, and he was created by Archie Goodwin. And the controller during like, like from the time he was created going throughout the 1970s, he was actually a pretty intense villain. Like he was a pretty cool villain. And so that's why when like at this moment, if you're probably kind of scratching your head, like the controller, who the heck is that? That's because Marvel's never really done anything with him. You know, in, in really in the last 20 years, Marvel never really did anything with the controller. If you're familiar with him, kind of like I am, it's kind of like, but why though? <laughs> of all the villains that Dan Slott could have used, why the controller? Uh, and it actually kind of works because the way the controller functions is he basically has these kind of like control discs, right? That he could basically put onto a human being and in turn dominate their wills, basically control them, hence the name the controller. And in this instance, he's essentially controlling Bethany. And it's kind of a cool thing because that's why she's getting these little, these little blanks, these little, these little gaps in her mind is because historically speaking, the controller has usually had a vendetta against Tony Stark. And so because of that, it, it, it's really an interesting way to bring back a classic villain that we wouldn't otherwise normally see. Now, of course, you've also got Jocasta going on here. And Jocasta is basically just kind of struggling at the moment in terms of the fact that she just didn't get enough rest is really kind of what this really seems to hit at. But she's also being reapproached by Aaron Stack. Now, this is a crazy thing. Aaron Stack and Jocasta having a relationship hasn't happened since like Marvel 2 and 1, 62, I think it was. Way back in like 19, 1960 something, 1970 something. It's been a long time since the two of them have like actually been in a relationship and been together. And the idea that like Aaron Stack kind of pops out of nowhere and is like, I want you back in my life. It's just kind of like, wow, like this, this is one of the things that's kind of cool about this, right? Because it's not really Dan Slott just sort of like running off and just saying, okay, so we're only going to focus on like the modern day things, right? Like we're going to take everything from Kieran Gillen's run forward and we're going to ignore everything else. It's kind of cool for him to, to look at like the entirety of the Iron Man landscape as it exists from... Iron Man number one, running all the way up into the modern day, and they're just saying, like, what of these things that were interesting can we basically put into my stories, right? Like, it's cool to see a writer do that. It's interesting to see that happen, is, is really what it is. Like, it's cool to see it happen. And so, of course, Andy Bang approaches Amanda Armstrong and says, look, if Tony Stark is desiring to immerse himself inside this universe, then go into the universe and get him, right? Like, go into the universe and find him. And that's exactly what she does. But what we end up learning here is that inside the Escape, things are kind of going awry, right? Like, the system's not working as it's supposed to. That basically people all over the place that one kid who was being a dick and got ba got banned for it like sure like he should have been banned for it there are people who haven't really done anything wrong that are getting booted out of the system left and right and the question is why like what is going on in the escape that's leading to people getting the boot from the entire system and so the result is that when amanda armstrong shows up and basically starts chastising tony stark like a mother then ultimately like the system responds by saying tony stark is the ultimate admin you got to get out of here and so it also you know it basically ends up shutting down amanda armstrong inside the escape which shuts her down on the outside right basically knocks her unconscious and so it's, a, it's it's an awesome idea because following that that's when you get the controller making his move and the controller basically saying i'm within the system here and i'm going to reinstate everybody who's ever been kind of a jerk and i'm in turn gonna like let them all loose right so it's like it's like if every like all the worst people ever on xbox live were just the only ones allowed to be in it uh in which case i guess go do your thing <laughs> if i don't have to deal with you that's fine but it's kind of nuts because from there you've got tony stark who manages to get himself out of the system and you've got amanda armstrong who's basically stuck in there and then amanda is kind of with away to the safe room and this is when things get so cool of course she's basically met with the arrival of of this massive this massive robot more or less has been shutting everything down only for it to open up and to reveal that like howard stark is there not only is howard stark here amanda armstrong is met with the arrival of what looks like maria stark essentially amanda armstrong is inside the escape basically in this kind of safe room this kind of locked off section of the escape with like the adopted parents of tony stark now if you're wondering why why tony stark's parents are adopted like if you wonder why like howard and maria stark are not the actual biological parents of Tony Stark, go read my, or go watch my videos, or go read uh, Kieran Gillen's run, The Life and Death of Tony Stark. It explains all of that. But yeah, so so with this going down the way that it is, Tony Stark in turn is just kind of like, okay, so like, we're shutting the whole thing down. Now, this is kind of a cool moment here, because this is sort of Dan Slott, this, it's an easy thing to overlook, but it's kind of Dan Slott really pointing all fingers at like the human side of Tony Stark, right? Because if this was Iron Man like 20 years ago in Marvel Comics, he would have been like, okay, keep the system running because we don't want to like damage our brand, and I'll try to find a way to take care of it from like the inside and then he would go back in and then he would win or something like that but he would potentially put the lives of humans at risk in order to basically like fix the problem of of the escape in this instance and really this is kind of the gradual change that you've seen with tony stark over the years in marvel comics is that he's kind of like okay shut the whole thing down there are not going to be any innocent lives right we're not going to worry about losing people because of the fact that i'm trying to get this escape to function the way that i want it to right because literally people are going to die if we let them stay in there and so of course this also ends up leading to uh to jocasta approaching aaron stack due to the fact 
fact that in some of the previous stories, Aaron Stack essentially found a way into the Escape and actually tried to take it down, right? Like Aaron Stack was basically looking at the Escape as kind of an encroachment on robotic ideologies, like robotic culture, uh, basically saying like, we have our own culture, you know, you don't get to infringe on that, right? Because like, you're not a robot. It's a cool thing. Like, I like that. Like, I like that idea of Aaron Stack being kind of like a robot activist, more or less, you know what I mean? At least he's not a slacktivist, right? Like making Reddit posts and, and doing like Twitter hashtags. Like he's actually doing something, which is kind of cool. <laughs> but nonetheless, the entirety of the Escape is basically going completely awry. Like everything's going nuts. Not only that, because of the fact that the people, the people who were in the Escape are walking around wearing these, these Iron Man masks that give them access to the Escape, they're in turn walking around in the real world. So everything they're doing in the, in, in the Escape is actually happening in the real world. When they see enemies out there, they're like, okay, so like I see what's like a giant space slug or something like that. When in reality, it's just like a hunched over old man carrying his groceries to the car. Now, this really begs the question, what stops them from like walking into a wall? Like, that's my question, because that would be funny. <laughs> or, or like walk off a bridge into the water and die. And the way this really seems to play out here is the landscape of the Escape models the real world. If you're walking through, you know, like some town in Oklahoma, you know, that town would be modern. Of course, you'd have like modern day schools and you'd have buildings and things like that. But as far as you perceive it in the in, in the Escape, it's like an old Western town. But the, the size of the buildings match the size of the buildings in the real world. And so the result of that is you're walking down a street that's actually there. So you wouldn't have to really worry about hitting anything. But of course, the entire world is basically going to pot now. Like Tony Stark has almost destroyed the entirety of the world. Anybody who's tapped into the Escape right now is basically going nuts, right? Like they're going through and like they're attacking all these various things, like people in the real world, all the while being manipulated by, by the controller himself. Now, the idea behind the controller is that once Iron Man, you know, finally arrives at his location and gets to where the controller is, we would normally look at that and say, okay, so like this is a pointless story because the fight's going to be over like that. Not true. Instead, what the controller has been doing is siphoning off all this power belonging to all these different people, which is kind of cool, which is pretty awesome because what it does is it enhances and it builds the controller. And this is why the story is kind of interesting. I mean, is it the coolest Iron Man story ever written? Not by a mile, but it is cool to see like an old school character return and then in turn, like kind of be amped up and be provided sort of a new scenario or at least a, a, a sort of power up of sorts from Dan Slott that makes it more intriguing, kind of brings him into the modern era. Now, in reality, I doubt, I doubt you're really going to see a lot going on from the character of the controller. Like, I, I doubt you're going to see a lot happening with him after this. I think it's really going to kind of be like, all right, you know, whatever. And he may or may not come back. I'm not really sure. I'm not really current, current on Iron Man. I'm just kind of current with this story arc. But what you also have here is the controller controlling Bethany. Now, remember, the controller can only control one person at a time. And so because of that, with, of course, Andy Bang uh, basically realizing, hey, look, like we can essentially like I can create a device that can disrupt the signal between the controller and whoever's being controlled. Of course, this leaves the controller turning on Andy and seemingly trying to knock him out. Now, this is where things get kind of cool. This is where things get interesting because what you end up doing is basically switching directly over to Amanda Armstrong, Howard Stark, and Maria Stark having a conversation. And this is a cool thing because what ends up going on here is Amanda Armstrong has to kind of come face to face with the reality of her situation. The idea behind this was that she got knocked up while she was an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. And so because she wasn't really in a position to get, you know, to, to be pregnant, she ended up basically putting the baby up for adoption or at least, you know, putting the baby in a situation to where Howard and Maria Stark could get their hands on it. And the result was that they raised Tony Stark as their own. But essentially, while she wasn't in a situation to have a kid, and this goes into the whole adoption argument, which don't really care. The idea behind this is that, you know, from from Maria, um, from Maria Stark's perspective, Amanda Armstrong abandoned her kid. And the result was that she wasn't there when Tony Stark was like being raised. She wasn't the one that raised him. She wasn't the one that really nursed him. She wasn't the one that like taught him the things he needed to know in order to, to grow up and become a productive member of society. All that was done by virtue of, of like Maria Stark. She even goes as far as to say that like Amanda Armstrong threw Tony Stark away like he was a piece of meat. And, 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 and in reality, like there's some truth to that. Uh, the issue with this is that when when all this really kind of comes to a head, it ultimately ends up affecting Tony Stark. And, th and, and the way this goes down is that with the controller, of course, you know, absolutely thrashing Tony Stark, you got James Rhodes, you got Wasp doing the best they can because everybody, all the other Avengers are all completely tied up. That's when Tony begins to realize that like Motherboard, the AI, the one that's basically is Maria Stark inside of this escape, that Motherboard has essentially seemed to have gone awry. And the result is that, you know, where it's controlling to uh, Tony Stark's armor and Tony Stark had grabbed Friday before and said, hey, look, I'm going to put you back in my suit. We're going to get you back under control. What Motherboard had done was actually destroy the, the the Friday AI concept, more or less killed it, and then replaced it. And so basically Tony Stark thought that he was putting Friday inside of his suit of armor, when in reality it was Motherboard the whole time. And this is when things get awesome, because what Motherboard says is, I can tap into your suit, I can create illusions, I can make you believe anything that I want you to believe. And so you're going to live the life that you always wanted. Like, you're not going to be Iron Man anymore. You're not going to be doing that. You're going to be living the perfect life. And so literally he starts kind of experiencing this hallucination inside of his own suit, right? Like, the suit systems are effectively working against him. And so where, where everything 
begins to kind of shift and begins to change. No longer is he seeing like the controller, you know, fighting against the Wasp and James Rhodes. Instead, it's the control. I'm sorry, it's the Incredible Hulk facing off against the Wasp and and uh, and Ant Man. Basically, like Avengers number four. And so this is this is it's awesome because what you end up getting is Tony Stark kind of living out this life as he perceives it, where like he goes back home and he's talking to his mom, you know, and he's talking to Howard Stark. As far as he's concerned, he's old school Tony Stark, and his parents never died. Nothing that's really going on in the world right now is real, according to him, because he's essentially locked inside the escape now. His mind has been brought in by by Motherboard, pretending to be Maria Stark, and that's where he is at the moment. But the biggest thing to really happen here is one of the biggest moments here is that he actually ends up consuming alcohol, right now. On the, on the, at the outset, it just kind of seems to be like a throwaway thing, right? It's just kind of like, okay, so that's interesting, I guess, you know, some small little thing, you know, he ends up consuming alcohol. But this is a big moment because what this does is it really sort of shows that like he's, that he's being tricked into relapsing, that Tony Stark has effectively relapsed and gone back to consuming alcohol again. And that's kind of a big moment for his character because now on top of everything that's going on, Tony Stark has another struggle that he has to deal with, trying to keep himself from relapsing in its entirety. Now, of course, with everything going on, because of the fact that Motherboard controls everything in the escape, right? Like from the environment that you see to how you see various other people, of course, she ends up using these abilities and turns them on Amanda Armstrong to change Tony Stark's perception, basically saying, hey, look, this is not a normal woman in here. This is a Russian spy, and she's here to steal secrets from Stark Industries. It's a really cool throwback to actually Black Widow from like not really Tales of Suspense number 52, like her first appearance, but like a couple of the later comics. But Black Widow was like originally a bad guy, right? And she actually duped Hawkeye into working for, uh, which led to Hawkeye basically reforming and then joining the Avengers later on. And then eventually like, like Black Widow reformed and then she joined the Avengers, which was par for the course, right? Like all the bad guys become good guys if they're interesting enough. <laughs> Otherwise, they just stay bad guys. But the fact remains that Tony Stark basically comes along and says, okay, let's track this chick down. Now, of course, with Amanda Armstrong fleeing for her life, she ends up running into Aaron Stack. Now, of course, Aaron Stack has basically been brought in here by Jocasta because he can hide. He can basically hide from the escape. And so th that would allow him to basically get in, infiltrate, find out exactly what's going on, report back to Jocasta, and then they could, of course, shut it all down accordingly. This was more or less complicated by the fact that Tony Stark's stuck in there now, right? I mean, if, if you forcefully disconnect a person from the escape, you could potentially kill them. And so they can't walk to the back of the room and kick the plug out of the wall, right? I mean, it would end up killing everybody who's attached to it. So uh, so the result of this is that Tony Stark really just kind of goes forward and just sort of like, because he can't find Amanda Armstrong, goes forward and seemingly lives this perfect life. Now, remember, all this is happening in a computer simulation. So time doesn't really have any bearing here. There's no real like hours pass or like days pass. It's just like all of it just kind of seems to happen. And in the mind of Tony Stark, he's living this full on life. In the real world like seconds are passing and so it's, it's an interesting idea here because when amanda starts talking to aaron stack and is kind of at her wits in and doesn't really know what to do Aaron stack pops up and says hey look you're tony stark's biological mom you should be able to know how to how to how to like get him out of this right like you have a rapport with him that nobody else will have you're his biological mother and regardless of how he acts and regardless of what he says he knows this is true and this is a cool moment here because what it does is it really sort of requires that amanda kind of play the role of of, of an actual mom here where previously she was his mom and she was doing the best she could but previously she was kind of approaching him more as like a friend as opposed to like i'm your mother and you're going to listen to me it wasn't until she got into the escape that she started doing that and then things started popping off but at the but the result here is that she doesn't really try to approach with more of an extreme hand she approaches with more of like a nurturing hand basically like kind of singing this song that would resonate with tony stark and so the result of this is that basically he picks up on it and says like that's amanda like it kind of brings him back to his senses now of course motherboard responds by basically revealing the truth of everything that's going on here and this is a cool moment because what she does is say like even though i'm an artificial intelligence like i'm inside this escape or whatever it is like i have access to all your cameras and everything and i've been watching you and one of the big confessions that tony stark made to james rhodes is ever since he came back after civil war ii using this basically cloned body this kind of artificial body he doesn't feel real he doesn't feel like a real human being and the reality of tony stark creating the escape was that it was a way for him to feel real he doesn't feel real when he's in the real world he only feels real when he's in the escape that's the whole situation that's the whole struggle of tony stark he doesn't feel like an actual person at the moment and indeed he's not it's looking at the idea that tony stark is not really tony stark anymore that tony stark is just kind of like some artificial construct creation of himself that he manufactured in order to bring his consciousness back in order to bring himself back to life but even then like it's it's still like a, a, a digitally stored consciousness inside of an artificially created body tony stark is by all standards of measurement a simulation and so again it gets kind of interesting here because from that point that's when you pick up with like everything going on with the controller and all this stuff popping off and normally i wouldn't add this into the video but we're going to do it because it's, it's kind of important here 
uh, you end up getting like Arno Stark, who's essentially returned and is working alongside uh, working alongside Bane Industries, or at least Bane Bane Tronics is really what they're called. Now, Bane Tronics is an old school company, right? Like the actual chick, Bane herself, she appeared back in I think it was Machine Man number. 17, I think it was, or like number 12. It was one of the old Machine Man comics from back in the day. She's been around for a long time. But the actual Bane company showed up in the old Iron Man comics back in 1990. And really, like Bane Industries, uh, the Bane Tronics complex, whatever you want to call it, it was basically one of these instances where Marvel was creating and really bringing in or consolidating a lot of like the, the various technological companies that existed out there that were going to be rivals to Tony Stark. But again, Arno Stark being here, of course, the brother of Tony Stark, basically brings in this idea that like they've really got somebody on their, you know, on their side who's smarter than Tony Stark himself. Now, for the character of Arno, one of the big questions that people have had is what's he been doing ever since the end of Kieran Gillen's run? Like, what was going on with him? And really, Brian Michael Bendis had gone as far as to say, like, he was going to bring back Arno and we were going to see a lot of stuff going on with him and a lot of storytelling in so far as what comes next. But of course, as we know, Bendis traveled over to DC Comics to write Superman and Action Comics. And so the result of that is that we never really figured out what was going on with him. All we knew was that at the end of Kieran Gillen's run, where he was previously in an iron lung and he was just, he had this illness, that ultimately he ended up creating a modified version of the extremis virus to take away his need to sleep and to cure him of his illness and he's just kind of traveled around the world doing whatever it is that he wants to do and that's really what 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 Dan Slott's kind of taken over with is that Arno just sort of travels around the world and just kind of gets involved in various situations based on what he thinks are interesting uh, a lot of it has to do with charity work but ultimately he's here because the entire scenario with like Tony Stark's escape kind of going awry has caught the interest of Arno and so Arno's basically working alongside Maintronics in order to like figure out what's going on and see if there's a way for him to like take over the entirety of the situation or at the very least just kind of do his own thing we don't really know exactly what his machinations and his schemes are but that's really all we get so far with Arno that's, that's really all we have with him and so while all this stuff inside the escape is really you know is, is essentially popping off you end up having Iron Man kind of at his wits end and basically desiring for it all to stop what he ends up doing is actually just kind of manufacturing kind of artificially creating a suit of armor for himself inside the entirety of the escape and then in turn like turning on motherboard now of course she does her best to sway uh, sway Tony to her side by basically going through and saying hey look like you know here here's this life that you could live here's this that you could live reverting him back to a child and and basically saying like as a little kid here Amanda Armstrong doesn't really know who Tony is and in fact he actually dismisses her uh, and just kind of sends her packing but then he also ends up turning on on motherboard herself and basically saying like I'm not someone who exists inside worlds I'm somebody who builds worlds I feel like I'm being manipulated by everybody around me so I'm taking control of it all I'm going to fix all of this and this is one of the coolest moments because as kid Tony Stark he literally starts going through and building the suit of armor on the fly and when he does he basically says like at the end of it all no matter what's said and done I am Iron Man like I am the invincible Iron Man and he es essentially assembles like this giant suit of armor in response to that you end up having like motherboard who kind of like you know you can't take over me in this place like I'm the entirety of this system kind of like lose her mind in its entirety you end up having like Iron Man basically assembling the God Buster armor which is the coolest thing because in return what it does is it literally blasts and completely destroys the motherboard AI right which basically shuts down the entirety of the escape system and so the big question that people have here though is that if Tony Stark is out there and if Tony Stark if, if his entire if his mind has been in the escape this entire entire time trapped in his suit of armor then where is Tony Stark and we end up finding out Tony Stark's just floating in space <laughs> Tony Stark's literally just out there in space just kind of floating into into oblivion so of course all this really basically goes back to and begins to focus on the controller right with the with the signal being sent out by Andy Bang which basically like shuts down the connection between the controller and everybody else and with the entirety of the escape being shut down what this basically does is it kind of frees the world's population from the control of, of the escape so on and so forth and then all you really have left is the controller now this is kind of the funny thing here is that where the controller had tried to find a backdoor into the escape and tried to find a way to use the escape as a means to control people in their entirety of course it didn't work but that's the reason why the motherboard ai went awry is because of the fact that the controller had basically tampered with it and screwed with it and messed it up didn't really know what he was doing and so as a result of that you basically had two different set of events going on at the same time you had the controller who was like hey look i'll make the best of a bad situation and basically started siphoning off all this energy from those who were tapped into the escape and then inside the escape you had motherboard basically going nuts just kind of losing her mind and so of course the controller at this point has grown to like a massive size right like he's grown to like huge in terms of all the power he possesses his strength speed durability so on and so forth and he really is in a lot of ways almost completely unstoppable he's literally running on all this energy and so in response to this tony stark builds a one-off he basically builds this one-off suit of armor that'll never be used again and it's basically a real world recreation of the godbuster armor that we saw inside of the escape now of course tony stark using this and then in turn like blasting uh blasting the controller and then completely like shutting him down right like taking this guy out and shutting him down by taking all this energy off of him what it basically means is that following this tony stark's never going to use it again and the reason why is because that suit of armor is too uncontrollable that kind of armor can work inside of something like the escape but tony stark has neither the time nor the ability to implement
implement this suit of armor in the real world and have it benefit anybody, right? So like, it's interesting because the entire concept of it, it really seems to be based in a lot of ways on the God Killer armor, but at the same time, it's a little bit different. But the, the issue with this is that again, it's just too powerful to exist in the real world. And so as a result, basically the day is saved, things wrap up pretty fast. Unfortunately, we'll never see the God Buster armor again. That's basically it. Like everything's just kind of wrapped up and, and it all kind of comes to a head. Uh, you end up having Banetronics that takes like all the information that was gathered by Arno Stark and then basically starts using it as a means to kind of beef up their technology and so on. So Sunset Bay comes out on top yet again. And then you also end up having Arno Stark who goes back to what he was doing. But the biggest thing behind all this, this is one of the big takeaways here, probably one of the biggest moments here is you end up having Tony Stark who actually, you know, after being with uh, Janet Van Dyne, ends up basically getting up and traveling to a bar. He ends up intending to relapse to go and get a drink and James Rhodes brings him back. And this is a great moment because James Rhodes is like, look, man, there are people out there who were counting on you to basically like to fix all this, right? You launched Stark Unlimited because you didn't want to be tied down to Stark Industries. You didn't want to have like your father's legacy. You wanted to create something of your own and that's honorable. And your first major attempt under Stark Unlimited was to create the Escape, which for the most part didn't really go as planned. It wasn't a catastrophic failure. It was because some villain got in there and basically broke into the system, but it showed you that there's weaknesses there that you need to correct. And instead of like turning back and saying, okay, let's work on this thing. Let's fix this stuff. Let's get it together. You want to relapse and you want to turn to alcohol. This is a very important thing because what it does is it hits at the idea of how easy it is to revert back to a safe place. It's so easy to do that, right? Like as people, it's our desire to do that, right? Like we, we go into a situation and we say, okay, there's this thing that I want to do. I want to achieve this. I want to do this thing. And it doesn't work out the way you plan. And it's like, okay, well, let's go back to our safe place as opposed to looking around you at the broken pieces and seeing how you can assemble it into what it was or something better. And it's natural. It's natural to want to do that. The issue with this is that Tony Stark retreating back to his safe place is alcohol. It's retreating back to alcoholism. And Tony Stark doesn't want to be there. James Rhodes knows Tony Stark doesn't want to be there. And so the result is come with me, man. Like we got to get you away from this. We'll focus on something else instead. It's a really touching moment. And it's a great way to, to end this story. What's up, guys? We are covering the story of Iron Man and his Ultron armor. By the way, if you guys want to see my uncensored videos, my versus videos, I'm going to start catching up on older videos, but because there's like no room to do it here on the main channel, I'm going to put them on Patreon as early access videos. And then as time allows, I'm going to, I'm going to like release them here on YouTube. So I have no idea when those videos will be released on YouTube proper, but they'll be on Patreon sometime over the course of the next few weeks or so. Probably I'll start doing it once I get back from Christmas. This story is amazing. Now, a couple things, right? We technically didn't really cover Iron Man volume four. This is more like Iron Iron Man Volume 5. Iron Man Volume 4 was a two-issue story, and we could cover it if you guys are really interested in seeing it, uh, but it's by no means essential, right? There's a couple things that take place there. The reality is that a lot of it really kind of set things up for this story, in so far that if you guys remember Volume 3, when we had like the, well, release when uh, Tony Stark had the Escape, which was basically like the Iron Man version of like the Oasis from uh, Ready Player One, that basically the, the minds of Howard and Maria Stark, or at least their, uh, I guess, digital personas or digital perceptions existed within that, that environment, and that our Arno Stark, the brother of Tony, who had been gone for a long time and we just never really knew what he was doing, has suddenly resurfaced working alongside Bane Electronics and had kind of been off doing his own thing. Now, for those of you guys who aren't really keeping up with what's going on with Iron Man at the moment, everything that Arno is doing is actually leading into the January launch of Iron Man 2020 number one, which is going to center on Arno Stark, presumably as Iron Man, right? So that's what all this stuff is kind of leaning, uh, kind of kind of moving to. But for the character of Jocasta, she's been experimenting with the idea of basically making herself more human. Now, a little explanation here, Jocasta was at one point supposed to be the wife of Ultron. Ultron was created by Hank Pym. Ultron, of course, became self-aware, and then he became the villain that you guys are all familiar with. And the idea was that Ultron longed for companionship. It longed for uh, having a wife of his own. And so ultimately, it stood to reason to Ultron that if Hank Pym was his quote-unquote father, and he was modeled after Hank Pym, more or less, then the idea was to in turn kidnap Janet Van Dyne, who was at the time the wife of Hank Pym, and then use her brain patterns and basically transfer her consciousness into Jocasta, and then Jocasta would go forward at his wife. Now, ultimately, that story, I think that was a Roy Thomas story from back in the day. It was stopped by the Avengers, but Jocasta was essentially activated at a future point in time and kind of had some semblance of, of Janet Van Dyne's persona. And that's really how she'd been ever since, right? She'd always been that way, that her mental patterns are essentially some measure of a duplicate of Janet's, and she's been functioning that way ever since. But the idea is that as part of Dan Slott's run on Tony Stark, what had gone on here is that Jocasta had been fighting for essentially robot rights. At the same time, what she's been doing is really longing to kind of evolve herself 
herself past her current form because she's always been this way. And so what she was doing was toying with the idea of having organic components tied into her machinery. And so what ended up happening here is she basically contacted Arno Stark, which is where this picks up. And Arno Stark is part of Banetronics, is basically working to kind of graph organic components into her machinery and essentially turn her into something akin to a human. Now, the issue with this and, and what had also kind of gone on behind the scenes, Simon Williams and Vision were basically fused into a singular being and Janet Van Dyne was knocked out and, and yeah, kidnapped by Jarvis, the butler of, uh, of the Avengers, although he was under brain control and we didn't really know who was causing it all until we got to the very end of that, which was like the end reveal on the last page. Then it was basically the return of Ultron, the return of, of, of Pimtron. And so what ends up happening here is Pimtron immediately comes busting into the place in order to, to recapture uh, recapture Jocasta. Now, the response to this from, from you know, Hank Pym's, or I guess really Pimtron is what we can call him, looking at this is that it's actually exactly what he's been shooting for, right? Because at the moment right now, Jocasta is a reflection of himself. You know, this in the story, you end up having a Hank Pym and Ultron who merged into each other and became a singular being. That happened quite some time ago. And the result is that they've kind of gone forward that way ever since. Jocasta now reflects that. She's not really designed to look exactly like Janet Van Dyne. Instead, she's part human, she's part machine. And this is, for lack of a better word, a huge turn on for, for Pimtron. <laughs> That's really what that is. But the issue with that is, remember, this is still Jocasta and she still does view Pimtron as an enemy of sorts. And so what you end up getting is that where the idea is to take her and to basically bring her back to Avengers or at least to where it is that he's operating out of and then in turn, you know, kind of complete the process and make her into his love interest more or less, make her into his wife. Of course, this leads into what it is that's going on with, with Tony Stark. And because Tony Stark and company had basically managed to subdue and ultimately capture uh, Vision and Wonder Man, or I guess they call him Wonder Vision now, uh, the issue with this is that because their mental patterns are essentially identical, then when they merge, it's impossible to figure out uh, where one starts and the other begins. And that's kind of the cool thing about this. You've literally got one of the scientists of Tony Stark who's like, their mental patterns are pretty much the same, right? So like, it's like trying to separate sugar from an already baked cake. It can't really be done. Now, ultimately, because of the fact that it's a it's a fusing of these two characters, Tony Stark like immediately begins to pick up on the fact that there's a pattern here, right? There's a, there's a, a pattern going on with regards to characters who are modeled after each other in some form or fashion being fused back together again. And the fact that Janet Van Dyne had essentially been kidnapped along with Jocasta who seems to be missing although you know at the time she had gone to basically get her surgery done Tony Stark realizes that Ultron is the one behind all of this the problem is that Tony Stark's a little behind Ultron by a few steps and so far as they pick up on the explosion at Banetronics when uh, Pimtron had broken in and once they arrive of course you've got uh, you've got you know Sunset Bane there who's freaking out over a, a cut on her cheek of all things and then you've got you know all these all these henchmen who were defeated and basically uh basically Arno Stark and here's the funny thing about this Arno Stark doesn't really care right and that's the nature of Arno. Uh, you know, it, originally it wasn't really that way, right? When he went into Kieran Gillen's uh, Secret Origins of Tony Stark and the introduction of Arno, Arno was very much like wanting to work alongside Tony and trying to create a better world, different things like that. But Arno seems to have changed drastically between the conclusion of the, the Secret Origin of Tony Stark and now. Now, again, we don't really know a lot about what he had been doing. It's one of these things where Dan Slott can kind of provide backup stories. So what, what Arno has been doing all this time, you know, following the Secret Origin story and, and whatnot, and just kind of give us a perception of why Arno shifted the way that he was, but he actually does have a motivation here, and his motivation is exceedingly cool. The main focus he has is really Jocasta, right? And we'll find out why he's focused on her so much, but basically he tells Tony, there's really nothing you can do here, right? I mean, when Pimtron showed up, Pimtron was like, I'm taking Jocasta and I'm leaving. And Arno was like, that's cool with me, man. And then basically took her and left. Because the reality is it's not really Jocasta that, that Arno's after. So I guess I kind of misspoke before. It's the result of his experiment of his work that really intrigues him, that, that really kind of strikes this interest in him. And so what ends up happening is Tony Stark basically Basically, you know, after having donned his Ultron Buster armor, uh, basically travels to Ultron's location after figuring it out with a few hints from Arno Stark that Ultron is basically operating in the tunnels below Avengers Mansion. And the reason for this is because the tunnels are only really treated as an emergency system, right? If for, if for some reason Avengers Mansion is compromised, like we saw during the events of Avengers Disassembled from back in 2004, 2005, or whenever it was, the Avengers needed an easy way out. They needed a way to basically get out of there and then marshal their forces and then go out and face whatever threat happened to be there. And so because of that, the tunnels have really been there for a very, very long time, but nobody's supposed to know about it. The fact that Arno does really shows how far reaching his knowledge is with regards to his intelligence and everything that goes on with the Avengers. But the other funny thing about this is you basically have Iron Man show up with Aaron Stack, right? With Machine Man, the boyfriend of Jocasta, essentially. And it's interesting because right off the bat, when this starts happening, Pimtron just starts to like torment and really just starts to make fun of Tony Stark and saying, so this is like your Ultron Buster armor. How predictable. Do you really believe I wouldn't have accounted for this? Pretty much all all these different circumstances had all been accounted for by Pimtron, including Tony Stark creating, you know, Ultron Buster armor. Now, what ends up happening here is Ultron basically acted
activates the machine this is going to begin the process of fusing janet van dyne into jacasta so they'll go forward as kind of the wife of ultron fused with the former wife of uh, of hank pym and then in turn they'll be able to basically operate as a singular couple but in response to this tony stark of course knocks janet van dyne out of the way ends up getting caught in the blast of the machinery and then merges with his own iron man armor now this is cool and this is something that we've never really seen before and that's one of the great things about dan slot writing you know dan slot like of course he reads the comics right i mean he reads like all these different comics and it's and you can always tell a difference between a writer who does do that and a writer who does not do that and the reason why is because what you end up running into is for writers who don't really read the comics but just kind of go and tell their own stories you start running into all kinds of inconsistencies right you start running into things where like an event will take place in their stories that totally contradicts everything else going on at that point in time in marvel or dc comics right so it can cause all kinds of issues but for the writers who do perform their research you can tell not only in terms of referencing and, and getting these little easter eggs from really really old stories but because it also seems to line up with seemingly everything else that's going on the other part of this and this is one of the reasons why dan slot is so good with this kind of stuff is he kind of builds this up right one of the things that's kind of easy to look at here is that one day old you know hank pym woke up or, or pymtron woke up and said i'm going to start fusing humans and, and and whatever together so i'm going to start with vision and wonder man and then just work my way forward from there and that's not the way this worked instead what he had done is he had basically sort of set up this kind of fake company right this this dummy corporation called ultimate makeover spa and the idea was that it would go to people who were desperate looking to become more attractive or, or whatever the case was and in turn say like we can make you better right we can help you get rid of that body fat or whatever the case may be when in reality what they were what was happening is they were being taken and they were being merged with cybernetic components and this was really basically the early days of pimtron's experimentation where he was experimenting on people and then in turn once he perfected the process then he used it on vision and wonder man and then once that proved to be successful then he wants to apply it to janet van dyne and to to jacosta it's a cool concept and that's why i like that right because you get exposition you get explanation it's not really just suddenly this happened and now moving on to the fight it really kind of pieces things together and ties everything together in a cohesive way the other half of this is that the forces of tony stark james rhodes uh janet van dyne or company are really kind of split in two different directions right you've got like james rhodes and them basically dealing with these cybernetic people and then you've got tony stark facing off against pimtron and that's why things are kind of cool is because it's a battle of wits you know as as much as it's a battle of physical force but in reality you're talking about an ultron who can plan for basically every eventuality facing off against you know tony stark a guy whose purpose is to think about and to overcome every eventuality you know, it's a unstoppable force meaning an immovable object and it's it's cool it's, it's pretty interesting to see that happen but ultimately what ends up taking place here is that uh, we kind of switch back over to bane tronics and this conversation between sunset bane and arno stark and this is when we learn the purpose behind what arno's doing and why it was so important the reality is that on some level arno knew that people out there even if he didn't know it was pimtron were experimenting with the idea of merging human and cybernetic components the difference here is that pimtron's experiments while they weren't necessarily rudimentary they weren't necessarily as advanced as arno because one of the things that's been hit at here is that while pimtron is or i guess hank pym is technically the scientist supreme the reality is that arno is smarter than he is and he's smarter than tony stark and pretty much everybody else in the marvel universe shy of maybe reed richards dr doom and valeria richards and that's basically it and so as a result of that when he was working on jacosta what he was doing was experimenting right if you guys remember back in volume three when arno stark was watching everything unfold in the escape and saw the digital basically images or the digital memories of howard and maria stark the fact that those digital images remembered everything about tony his childhood the whole nine yards what it meant is that even if it's only in a digital form it is them all they needed were physical bodies and that's what arno stark had basically been working on by being able to combine inorganic with organic components what this would mean is he would be able to artificially create bodies and if he can artificially create bodies in the same way that tony stark brought himself back in the same way that james rhodes was brought back after civil war ii and so on then what it would mean is that arno and what his purpose is or what he's trying to do is create bodies and then in turn resurrect howard and maria stark and take their digital memories from the escape and put them in their physical bodies it's the reason why he walked off with those memories why he took those digital memories and left and because he wanted to basically put them in new bodies and essentially resurrect his parents and it's a really awesome idea because we've never seen that happen since the death of howard and maria stark they stayed dead right they're one of the unsung instances of like heroes dying and then staying gone it's not something that you see happen very often but they're one of the few that basically fall in line with that being the case the other half of this and one of the things that dan slot nips in the bud quite readily where are the avengers and all this right if this massive fight is taking place out in new york where are the avengers and so what we ended up finding was that tony stark had sent out an sos to contact the avengers right to call in for help and what ultron did was intervene he basically intercepted the transmission and then faked a response from captain america saying we're on our way when in reality he sent captain america and company all the way to like the other side of space right 
it's one of those instances where Dan Slott seems to have essentially thought of everything, every scenario in order to make the story feel cohesive and well put together and tight knit. It's a very, very smart move. And so in response to this, the scientific team of Tony had basically found a way to essentially split the minds of Vision and Wonder Man in two and restore them back to their original selves. And so what they end up doing is basically alerting Tony Stark. James Rhodes jumps in, kind of gets into the conflict, which is sort of a big deal for him. Because remember, the last time he was in a conflict like this, it was with Thanos prior to the events of Civil War II, and he died. But at the same time, of course, Tony Stark is in need of this treatment that'll basically separate him from his own armor. If that doesn't happen, then he will basically die here. And so the funny thing about all this is that where this massive fight, right, between James Rhodes and Ultron, which goes exactly the way you would expect it to, where James Rhodes is getting handled quite readily, basically. <laughs> He's no Iron Man, and the War Machine armor's cool, but it's just not enough to keep up with Ultron. While all this stuff is happening, Tony Stark's getting his treatment, he's being separated away from his own armor and basically being returned back to his normal self. What you end up getting here is Arno Stark, who resurrects his parents, who basically creates new bodies and throws their minds in it. It just happens behind the scenes. And that's one of the cool things here is that Arno is just kind of removed, but also there. And it's a cool circumstance to see. It just kind of strikes me as interesting, right? Like, I don't know what it is about it, but it just sort of strikes me as intriguing. It's something that I just don't really see all too often. Now, of course, the procedure with Tony Stark is successful. Of course, Tony Stark goes back to his normal self. The problem with this is that the Friday AI, along with the other artificial intelligent components of Stark's whole process, were basically destroyed in order to keep Ultron from hacking into his systems or to keep himself from being merged with his armor. Now, of course, it proved to be ineffective in the first place, but what this means is that with regards to all the various Iron Man suits that he has, none of them can really work because there's no AI there. At the same time, he ends up having to go low-tech because if he goes low-tech, Pimtron can't really access it. And so what he does is he basically dons one of the really, really old-school Iron Man armors, an interesting concept to sort of yank out of the woodwork. In addition to this, there's a few things that happen in really, really quick succession. One of the first things is that the forces, the scientific forces of Tony Stark show up with these weaponized, you know, kind of cures, for lack of a better word, and basically separate these various henchmen who had been merged into cybernetic components from the cybernetic components themselves, restoring them back to them, back to their normal selves. The other part of this is Tony Stark starts talking to, uh, to Hank Pym, and one of the things he says is, he's not a real person. That Tony Stark basically says, he's a simulation. And the reason why is because his physical body is dead, right? It's gone. The only way for him to really return was to create an artificial body for himself in the same way that Arno Stark had created artificial bodies for Howard and Maria. When that was done, he downloaded his consciousness into that body. Now, of course, we talked about that when we first picked up with Tony Stark Iron Man as the pickup after the events of Civil War II with the return of Iron Man after he was killed by, uh, by Carol Danvers during the Civil War II event. But the other part of this, and one of the other cool things that goes on, is Howard and Maria are watching this. And as far as we're concerned, they really are just real people, right? So you can almost kind of see this as Dan Slott seeming to kind of build up to like the Iron Man equivalent of like the clone conspiracy from Spider-Man or something along those lines. But it's, it's cool here because when he has this conversation, like when he says this, he basically tells Hank Pym, on the count of three, my guys are gonna fire their machines at you. And when they do, they're gonna separate you and Ultron. You're gonna go back to your normal self and Ultron's gonna go back to his normal self. Pymtron will basically be a thing of the past. And it's cool because I was looking at this and I was like, okay, finally, somebody's basically undoing Pymtron. Because the reality of this is that Ultron was a, was a really cool villain. And I loved stories like Age of Ultron. I loved how they were written. And Hank Pym was always somewhat intriguing, if only for no other reason than the fact that he had like his multiple personalities and he was always having a mental breakdown or something along those lines and not really seeing those two characters operate and be out there in the form that we're used to and instead just kind of seeing this Pimtron concept which has just basically been lingering for a number of years would be kind of cool to see it go away unfortunately Dan Slott doesn't do that <laughs> He doesn't separate the characters. Instead, Pimtron just basically surrenders out of his desire to remain in his current form. And then in turn, he's basically, you know, handed over to the Avengers who have arrived on the scene at the conclusion of the fight. How convenient. <laughs> you know, after finally figuring out what's going on and realizing they were sent to, the, the, sent to a location where there was no major conflict. But as a result of that, Pimtron is essentially locked away inside of a vibranium prison of sorts that's created by Black Panther and then essentially locked closed using enchant uh, enchantments of Doctor Strange. Now, what this means is it basically allows allows Dan Slott to put Pimtron on the back burner. There's room here for Dan Slott to bring uh, Pimtron back, but to basically remove him and put him in a position to where you as the reader, you know, and I as the reader, don't really have to ask the question, is he going to make a return? It gives really Dan Slott and the rest of Marvel the ability to just focus on other things. What this really comes down to is just tying up loose plot threads and, and really nothing more. And so, so following this conclusion, this defeat of, uh, of Pimtron, then things just kind of unfold. Things just kind of go down from there. Uh, you end up having Arno Stark, who basically develops the, the god 
Hulkbuster armor of Tony Stark from the Eastgate, but uses it for his own ends and then really kind of dons himself, you know, as Iron Man 2020. And then, the, of course, this will basically pick up in January. But basically, that's kind of, you know, assuming this will this will continue on, I don't know why it wouldn't. I think that what you're going to end up seeing is kind of like dual Iron Man stories, right? So it's going to be like the Iron Man equivalent of like Superman and action comics, right? You're going to have Iron Man 2020 and you're probably going to have the Iron Man comics. I haven't read too much into the solicitations. I usually like to keep myself surprised with what's going on, but I do like the idea. The story was awesome. I love the idea of, of Iron Man's uh, uh, Ultron Buster armor, especially because it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> that he used Ultron Buster armor on an Ultron that was totally prepared for it. That was actually kind of cool, right? So with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys want to see my uncensored videos, my versus videos, or my early access videos, head over to patreon.com slash comics explained. And if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and I'll catch you guys later. Peace.